Welcome to Writer to Writer, a program about and for writers, brought to you by Florida Community College at Jacksonville. I'm Mary Sue Keppel, your host, and with me today is Susan Vreeland. Welcome, Susan. We're so pleased that you're here with us today. So am I. Thank you. Susan, I want to talk to you about the two big journeys that you've made in your life. One of them is your journey through illness to best-selling author, and the other one is the journey from high school English teacher to best-selling author. Mm -hmm. Which of those two would you like to start with? Well, they do coincide, but I suppose uh, let's do the illness first. Okay. Get that in our past. Well, that's what drew me to you. I uh -huh. read your website... Did and I thought, this lady has some message for all of us as writers. I was hoping that I could make a living as a writer for maybe um, a half a dozen years. I, I taught high school English for 30 years. And maybe about my 25th year, I was beginning to think, could it be possible for me? And I had been going to writers' conferences in the summers. And I had one novel out um, with a very small press. And uh, I had uh, uh, good luck with that because it was made into a CBS television movie. Wow. But just the, week, the months before its broadcast, I had been experiencing uh, a lot of difficulty, which then I learned that the uh, two days before the broadcast mm. that it was lymphoma. Oh, wow. So uh, it showed on a, on a CBS Sunday night movie, and on Monday morning I started chemotherapy. Wow. So that was the best of times and the worst of times. Mm -hmm. And the name of it, in case someone would like to look it up. Oh, that book. Yes. It's out of print now. It's What Love Sees. It's in libraries. Uh-huh. Yeah. And the CBS show is the same? Same title. Same title. It airs every once in a while again. I had been working at that time on short stories. And I had to, of course, leave high school teaching to um, do this regimen of chemotherapy for six or eight months. But during that time, I continued writing short stories. And, and many of them were art-related. I was uh, fascinated by Vermeer, having seen uh, the National Gallery catalog of that show in 95, 96. And I remember when I was uh, in such pain that I couldn't read or write, I could sit in a chair and enjoy his paintings. And I just poured over them and sank myself into them. My name is Dutch, but I had no uh, inkling of any Dutch ancestry or I couldn't trace my family roots. But I thought, maybe this is a time for me to look at Dutch art and find in it something about the sturdiness of Dutch character that I could call upon. So I didn't look just at Vermeer, but of all, at all Dutch art. About the same time, I uh, read two Time Magazine articles, one about um, the grandsons and, and daughters of Nazis, former Nazis, uh, coping with the realization that their beloved grandparent had been involved in uh, atrocities. Mm -hmm. The other article was about Jewish families attempting to locate and claim their family's art stolen from them during the Holocaust. I put those two thoughts together with my new love of Vermeer and, and wrote one story in which I imagined a Vermeer painting. Now, I had to invent characters, but that process was really uh, uplifting for me in a way because mm -hmm. the more I um, entered the lives of these characters the less 
I was thinking of my own illness. And, and the creative act was keeping me from self-absorption. There's no health down that road. Mm-hmm. That we know. Mm-hmm. I, at least I know that. Mm-hmm. So uh, with my imagination fed by art, I began to write a second story on Vermeer. Uh, using this girl in this imaginary painting. And that story had to be in the 17th century. So there I had two stories with 350 years in between. And someone in my writing critique group said, well, you know, Susie, these are great stories, but there's a huge gap. Can't you do something with that? So... I began to, I thought, hmm, well, there's four centuries represented. I can have four stories and call it Delft Quartet, Delft, the Dutch city where Vermeer lived. But, uh, and I should say, as I was more and more involved with the characters, uh, I was... uh, going through the chemotherapy cycles, and they weren't as devastating as they were reported to be. And so I went, I went back to work. Do you think it was because you were so involved in some other process? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, however, I did have a recurrence a couple mm-hmm. months after. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's two ways to look at that. If we could say, oh, this is the worst thing that has happened to me. Or I could say, oh, I have another year off school to write. (laughs) So those four stories, you see, then became eight stories as I wrote linking stories in between them. And had it not been for that second year, those stories would have been buried in a collection of short stories and you know that a, a story collection as one's debut work doesn't, doesn't make a big splash. Mm. So on, only then, when I was doing the second bout, mm-hmm. did, it, did it become uh, a book. And, and, and did I become convinced that creative endeavor is uh, a... a a road to healing. Mm -hmm. Not only because it keeps you from being self-absorbed, but it gives you a goal. Mm -hmm. My goal was to finish eight stories, and because I was in in an isolated environment after a bone marrow transplant and Mm -hmm. surgery, I I had to send my stories to um, my critique group, and uh, they critiqued them and sent them back to me. Uh, but my goal was to finish the eight stories, and when, I, when my hundred days of isolation was over and I could walk to Kinko's, <laughs> I would make 12 copies. Kinko's was going to be my publisher. That's, that was the, the thought I had. Uh-huh. And, I would, and my print run would be 12, and I would send them to my critique group in case I didn't make it through so they would know that in my last months I was happy and productive and they would see my sensibilities and my appreciation for the beauties of the world in my Vermeer stories. Now how did we get beyond these wonderful 12 copies to best-selling woman, best-selling author? (laughs) I uh, began then to send them out to literary magazines separately. At the same time, I was uh, researching in a literary marketplace for an agent. And about close to the same time, uh, Missouri Review picked up one of the stories, Mm -hmm. and an agent was interested. Uh And quite a bit thereafter, uh, the fiction editor of Missouri Review said, you, you told us that this story was a col- in a collection. We'd like to see the whole thing. I'm also an editor of a small Denver-based publisher, McMurray and Beck. I had never heard of McMurray and Beck. And Mary Sue, I'm ashamed to say I did the unthinkable. 
I did not respond back to this man because at the same time I had finally gotten an agent and I wanted her to have time to shop it around New York. So two or three months went by and then this editor did the unthinkable in the publishing world and asked me again. <sighs> yeah. Do we have a chance? Has it been picked up by somebody else? So this time I thought, I'd better do this. And very quickly thereafter we had an offer and a, uh, about a month after the hardback came out, uh, McMurray and Beck, who had purchased all rights for a very small amount, staged a, uh, an auction, mm -hmm. and there were three big publishing companies. They all rejected it in manuscript form, and they had um, a bidding war going. And so that's how I moved from the small publisher to Penguin. Now, what happened that the small publisher had such a, a recognizable auction? I mean, what happened we had, to your We book? had good reviews. And so they the, sent it out. They didn't send me on tour. They didn't have money for that. But they sent out lots of copies to reviewers across mm -hmm. the country. And at the same time, Book Sense, the uh, independent book sellers organization, put out their first list of their book sense picks. And mine was pick number one in their first issue. So that helped a great deal Absolutely. with independent bookstores. Sure. Well, now that you're into your second and third and fourth and fifth book, no doubt, some of them written and some of them in your imagination, mm -hmm. is your writing process the same or have you changed it? I know you were going through this yeah. terrible trauma of the chemotherapy, and, and that is no longer part of the writing process. But no, but I hope that the sensibility that I developed at that time is still present. Henry James says, be, try to be a person upon whom nothing is lost. Mm -hmm. and, and I have to tell you that after uh, I... I went through numerous drafts and in my isolation and then went back out into the, into the world. All the world seemed glorious and every, <laughs> every simple thing, a blade of grass, a glass of milk, seemed just a gift to me, uh, a breeze, everything. And I think the sensibility that is expressed in one line by Vermeer, uh, I mean by my imagined ah, Vermeer, I hope is still true, and, and he's positioning his daughter to, to do this portrait, this girl in hyacinth blue. And on the table, there's this gorgeous honey-colored light coming down on her, and on the table, and there's a glass of milk. And Vermeer's wife rushes over to take away the glass of milk because it had been left from another daughter. And Vermeer says, no, no, leave it, Katerina. It makes the whole corner sacred with the tenderness of just living. Mm. That's the sensibility that I had, that appreciation for the simplicities of life. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and the attention paid to them, that an artist pays in studying them visually and painting them. Mm -hmm. That's what I hope is carried into my next novel, also about a painter, mm -hmm. my next short story collection, also about painters, mm -hmm. and the novel after that, mm -hmm. again, with an art tie-in. Now, you know so much about art. Tell us a little of your background in art. Only as a lover. I am not an art historian. I had an, uh, a great-grandfather who lived with us when I was a child, mm -hmm. and I loved going out to his studio mm. to smell that turpentine and see him smear colors <laughs> together on his palette. <laughs> And one day, I think I was about eight, he took my hand in his kind of spidery one, and with real watercolor paper, he guided my hand to paint a calla lily. And I think at that moment, I had an appreciation for how one color can blend into another and for the grace of line. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've, I've loved paintings just 
as an appreciator of paintings all my life. You know, related to paintings and art and the appreciation of the writer for the craft, I saw that one of the themes in your books is the, the conflict of the creative artist with the rest of life as well. Not just the appreciation of it, but if you are a great artist, then what's the toll on the family? Right. And how do you make those decisions? Right. Both my uh, book on Vermeer, Girl in Hyacinth Blue, and on Artemisia Gentileschi, the Italian Baroque painter. They, the, both of those people had to deal with supporting a family. Mm -hmm. Vermeer had 11 children. Mm -hmm. Artemisia, a woman, had a harder time getting commissions because she was a woman. She, but uh, she still was the first woman to make her living entirely with her brush. I was thinking more of the, of the problems that the really creative artist has with relationships. Well, in, in uh, Vermeer's story in Girl in Hyacinth Blue, he recognizes that his wife, Katerina, never has him completely to herself, even for a moment, because he's always responding visually to elements around her or to how the light plays on her. And I think the daughter realizes that too. Mm -hmm. When she says, the interest that he paid to me when I was sitting for this portrait was the same interest that he paid to the glass of milk. <laughs> it just kind of shocked me with that line there. I forgot what I was going to say next. <laughs> But truthfully, um, one of the, the very astounding things that I, that I found in your stories was your search for, for those details of the particular time. Mm -hmm. And the glass of milk being such a wonderful detail of a family, but then you found the details of the time and the place in which your historical novel is taking place. Now, how did you find all those details? What kind of research did you have For to do? For Girl in Hyacinth Blue, I consulted 78 books. Mm -hmm. Not having, I didn't need to read them all completely, but I, uh, I had to find out how windmills were engineered, how people heated their houses, what, the, what a peat bog was for, <laughs> and uh, the clothing. Of course, clothing and food is easy. You just look at paintings, mm -hmm. which I love to do anyway. Sure. And, and still lifes often had displays of food on a table. But, but what the house looked like, would you find that in the paintings as well? Interiors, uh -huh. yes. And, uh, and the well, marketplaces. And, sure. Yeah. Sure. And also, I looked at period maps of Delft and of all of Holland. I could not set... There's, there's uh, eight different stories. I could not set any story in a village that at that time was still underwater and hadn't sure. been dredged and uh, yeah. dried up yet. So I had to locate period maps mm -hmm. to know where the canals were at that time and what year were they built so I could know how they would, what their route was to travel places. And was the internet part of your research or was, for, was this mostly books? Uh, mostly books for that. Uh, and I, and I uh, had to find those transportation details for The Passion of Artemisia, my new book, as well. How many days would it take a stagecoach to cross France? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. kind of thing. Would you call this historical novel writing? I mean, is this an historical novel genre? Yes, yes. What do you, what do you say are the characteristics of the historical novel? From your point of view as a writer, mm -hmm. uh, I it's a, it's a story of of one person set against a background of a time period, mm -hmm. but in in this particular case, the the main character is the the known person. It's not like an unknown person who happened to live during the Franco-Prussian War or something, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. also an historic novel. Mm -hmm. In my case, 
I'm very interested in the process whereby an historic figure at first is buried in archives and may languish there for centuries even, as in the case with Artemisia Gentileschi. Not until the 70s and 80s was there any scholarship done on female artists mm -hmm. to speak of, mm -hmm. to speak mm -hmm. of. So then, uh, when scholars dig around in these archives and write a monograph or write a book, and my, my main source, I have to say, was Mary Garrard's Artemisia Gentileschi, The Image of Female Heroine in Italian Baroque Art, came out in 1989. Mm -hmm. So you see then from mm -hmm. archives, sure. then it moves into academia. Mm -hmm. And that figure may then begin to appear on course syllabi. And then if the character has made a significant contribution and is complex, multi-layered, is fascinating, then I think it's inevitable that a creative mind will, will discover that person and pull him or her out of academia into the popular culture. Mm -hmm. And that last leap was what I wanted to participate in. And it, it, I think it usually happens with not just one creative mind, but when the time is mm -hmm. ripe, more than one creative mind goes to work on it. Virginia Woolf in um, A Room of One's Own says, women's history must be read into the scene of its own exclusion. It has to be both discovered and made up. Well, that was a, a tremendous invitation to me, <laughs> but it will be for other people Absolutely. too. And part that they make up will be, will be different from mine. We hope historical writers hope that it has the ring of truth, mm -hmm. that, that we have honesty to the, the integrity of the character. But once we decide on our story within the story, to distinguish a fiction writer's work, a novel, from a biography, uh, the fiction writer eliminates those portions of the person's life that don't contribute to the themes, the arc of one story that is w working on. And sure. the arc of my story was Artemisia's transcendence over a rather rocky start to adulthood, to um, forgiveness of betrayal, and the possibilities of love in a ruptured life, and the possibilities for a woman artist in a male world male, in male Rome. World, yes. Maybe I could just take that transition into um, present-day world in the world of Calliope and the way in which you and I first met each other was through Calliope and That's you right. sent one of your, uh, the Calliope of which I am the editor, and you sent one of your, I suspect, Very your early, early, early short Maybe stories. Maybe it was one of the first three. Really? Yeah. And, and what led you to send it to Calliope? Probably found it in a, uh, a list. Oh, of certainly. I, did, uh, I had a lot of research to do it, and, and continued to for a, a dozen years in reading over Writer's Market and in um, uh, finding samples of literary magazines from across the country in university libraries mm -hmm. and reading, say, three issues of a literary magazine even if I read just the first page of every piece of fiction, that would give me a, a sense for what that magazine was interested in. And then I, I began to develop maybe a list of, of my, uh, the magazines that I hope to be in someday. Well, we are very pleased that you hope to be yes. in Calliope, and of course we're in Calliope. Um, and you've given some very good hints to writers who want to crack into the writing mm -hmm. market, saying, read the first pages of all of these short stories in a particular issue. Sure, that can tell uh, what the tone is, whether they use first or third, whether they do historical or only contemporary, whether language is foregrounded or whether it's rather plain spoken, humor or, or serious drama. Science fiction. 
Sure. Experimental. Sure. But then you have to write notes. You, you do have to keep records of all of that as you begin uh, getting more and more acquainted with a wider range of journals. Well, it must be fascinating to see what your um, workshop looks like at home. Where do you write? I have a lovely office that looks out onto a tiny patio and uh, it's filled with books about writing and with fiction and with reference books having to do with time uh, because much of my writing involves mm -hmm. uh, past mm -hmm. centuries. Mm -hmm. I keep a set of journals. Not a writing journal, but a set, a set of, of them. them. I should say writing, they're, they're my reading logs. Ah. So that as I am reading a piece of fiction and I come across a sentence that is absolutely astounding to me, I don't want to lose it. So you keep it. And with that, but, uh, yeah. with that, I'm going to have to say this has been a pleasure okay. to have you talk about writing, to listen to the way in which you put together books and the fact that you have come on and shared all this knowledge with us is very, oh, very, my very pleasure. fine. My pleasure. Thank you for joining us today. This has been Writer to Writer. I'm Mary Sue Keppel, and so pleased that you joined Susan Freeland and me.